Great. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ambassador Bell and Isabel Kennard, for um, having me. I appreciate uh, the World Affairs Council of Richmond, including me. I spend so much of my time on domestic issues. I feel like I'm uh, uh, very fortunate that uh, the World Affairs Council would, would consider me for speaking uh, outside the country about, uh, and other issues. And the Council for America's First Freedom, I have tremendous respect. It's a, it's a wonderful organization with tremendous potential to really help us to understand religious freedom and educate the American public about religious freedom. So it's uh, a privilege to be associated with um, your fine work. Isabel does such great work. Um, I think most of you know, I'm going to start with something I think most of you know, have been reading about, that, that in the fall of 2008, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a non-binding resolution <clears throat> that called on all countries to pass laws prohibiting defamation of religion. And this was introduced by a number of Islamic states with support from nations like Venezuela, Belarus. And the statement passed 85 to 50 with 42 abstentions. I always wonder about those abstentions, don't you? <laughs> I won't say cowardly abstentions, that sounds a little <laughs> negative, but, uh, but they just, they didn't, they didn't take a stand. And then on March 26 of this year, the same resolution was adopted, as many of you know, by the United Nations Human Rights Council by a vote of 23 to 11, with 13 nations abstaining. Now, some people who didn't like this resolution celebrated because they thought, well, if you add 13 and 11, you know, they finally have a majority of some sort against it, but nevertheless it passed, 23 to 11. Well, not surprisingly, the chief sponsors of this resolution are the very governments with anti-blasphemy laws that protect primarily the majority faith and, for the most part, ban all religious dissent. Hillel Noor of UN Watch, which is an independent human rights group, I'm sure you know, charges that the resolution legitimizes, quote, the criminalization of free speech in countries like Sudan, Egypt, Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia. Well, in my view, UN resolutions like this one, as well as ongoing efforts within European nations to prohibit hate speech, are Orwellian signs that human rights are being redefined on the world stage to permit violations of human rights. As Nauer points out, human rights were designed to protect individuals, to guarantee every person free speech and free exercise of religion, but most certainly not to shield any set of beliefs, religion included. At the heart of this debate in the United States and Europe, and I'm going to confine my remarks to the United States and Europe for the most part, is a simple but profound question. Can we live with our deepest differences in a democratic society, especially our religious differences, while simultaneously upholding robust freedom of expression? Or to put it in somewhat sharper terms, to what extent, if any, does freedom of expression specifically free speech and a free press, include the right to offend deeply held religious convictions. Now, for some religious and political leaders in Europe and the United States, the answer is very clear. When free expression crosses the line and becomes highly offensive to religion, as in the now infamous case of the Danish cartoons mocking the Prophet Muhammad that were published in 2006, the state can and should intervene. This understanding of free expression and its limits is, of course, I would say, rooted in a long tradition in Europe of state establishment of religion. Even though such state establishments are mostly a shadow of their former strength, blasphemy laws and other protections for religion, or at least favored religion, persist. Of course, where secularism is established, France, for example, Controls on free expression are meant to serve the interests of the state. And many in France, uh, that means control on religion and control on speech about religion. Denmark itself, which is of course ground zero for the cartoon conflict, has a blasphemy statute that calls for a fine and up to four months in prison for demeaning, quote, a recognized religious community. A few years ago, one 
Mogens Glistrup was imprisoned for 20 days for comparing Turks to rabbits. Now, you note that the publishers of the cartoons escape prosecution under that same law. Now, although such laws are rarely enforced, the Danish cartoon controversy reignited an old debate about their necessity and their impact on freedom of expression. Instead of eliminating blasphemy laws, some European nations have revised them or expanded their application in order to account for religious pluralism. Thus, the old concern about blasphemy against the state religion has been replaced by a new concern about hate speech against religions. You may recall that before her death a few years ago, Italian journalist Oriana Fallaci faced trial for her outspoken views about Islam. She was charged with violating Italy's outrage to religion law, as well as with inciting interreligious hatred. Meanwhile, in the United Kingdom, a 2007 incitement to religious hatred law would also appear to place new limits on free expression. Although it's supposed to be narrowly drawn, thanks to the insistence of the House of Lords, no less, to cover only threatening expression that sparks hate and violence, it remains to be seen how and when the government will deter determine when strong speech against a religious group becomes hateful. We got some indication of how this might play out last month when British authorities deported Dutch lawmaker Gerrit Wilders, declaring him a danger to public security. Wilders' offense is that he offends, pretty much. He stirs outrage by comparing the Quran to Mein Kampf and disseminating his film that suggests Islam is an inherently violent religion, among other things. And so although he was invited to the UK by a member of the House of Lords to screen his screed, Wilders is apparently too hot for Britain to handle. Meanwhile, back home in Amsterdam, the Court of Appeals has decided to prosecute Wilders for hate speech. Well, like many assaults on free speech, the actions of the British government and Dutch courts get a pass in many quarters because Gerrit Wilders is such an unsavory target. Many Europeans find his message crude and dangerous and view him as little more than an attention-seeking bigot. British officials defend the deportation of Wilders by appealing to public safety. And of course, given the violent protests after the Danish cartoon controversy several years ago, they may have reason to worry. But in my view, the answer in these situations, particularly this one, is to protect the speaker and prosecute the lawbreakers and not to allow a heckler's veto. If these examples of censorship and repression of speech were just isolated incidents, then I might be less alarmed. But they come at a time when freedom of speech is losing ground in nations across the globe, most disturbingly in the democracies of Europe. Many of my European friends and some of my American argue that religious freedom itself depends on state protection of religion from hate speech that targets religious symbols and beliefs. For believers in Europe or in America who may be tempted to embrace new blasphemy laws and hate speech guise, be warned. What may serve to protect sacred symbols and beliefs from satire or attack today can be used to limit religious freedom tomorrow.